Great. So today we're going to talk about bloodline. And I think bloodline is something that fits in quite well with what we spoke about uh, last time when we met, when we were discussing spiritual warfare. There's a huge part of spiritual warfare that's actually done on the bloodline. So firstly, I had one of my clients uh, that sent me this photo and I'll share it on the group as well. Um, it's called ancestral mathematics. In order for you to be born, you needed two parents, four grandparents, eight grand, great grandparents, 16 second great grandparents, 32 third great grandparents, 64 fourth great grandparents, and so it goes on to 2048 people. I mean, that's immense if you think of how many people were actually involved in, in getting you here. And you might ask, but why is this important? And I'm going to read the scripture for us in a few seconds from Deuteronomy. But when I started studying, uh, you know, bloodline and, and especially for the application and the quantum uh, academy, I wanted to understand how many people make up four generations. Because the word says, I will visit the iniquity of the forefathers to the third and the fourth generation. And um, I was surprised to see that it's uh, four generations is 64 people. So 64 people contributed to whatever it is that you're sitting with today. And what's scary about that is we tend to think, okay, well, I know more or less what happened in my parents' life and in my grandparents and maybe a little bit about my great-grandparents. But we don't realize that there's a big part of our bloodline that could affect our lives today that we do not even know about. We don't know what those people got up to and what they were involved in. And that's why it's important to work on our bloodline. So firstly, I wanna start with what is a bloodline. So Natanya, anytime you wanna chip in, please feel free to do so. But in Deuteronomy 5, we get a repeat of the 10 commandments. Go and look at it. It's, it's a, a, an exact word for word, merely repeat of the 10 commandments. And I believe that God does this because he reminds us that he's given us clear rules how to live and how to conduct ourselves. And these rules come with clear instructions. And it, it says in the word that if you follow the rules that God says, sets out for us to live by, that there will be blessing. But if we do not follow the rules, there will be a curse. So we can do a, a discussion at some time about the discussion, uh, the commandments and which commandments are applicable to us, how they are applicable and how do we keep to it. And Natalia and I are both very passionate about the commandments. And I just want to challenge you with this one thing. If the commandments were not applicable anymore to us today, where are the curses coming from? Because if, if there's no commandment breaking, there would be no curses. The fact that you and I and a lot of people out there are living with things in our lives that are not perfect, everything in our lives are not a blessing, it means that there are curses. And the fact that there are curses means that there are commandments that are being broken. So I just want you to, to think of that. So God says, these are the rules, keep it and be blessed, don't keep it and be cursed. But then he goes on and he says that the blessings and the curses laid out that are related to the commandments will run down a family line. So it's not just the curses that come down the family line. There's also something called the generational blessing. So I want us to look at the scriptural reference for this. And I want to encourage you when we are done, please take the whole Deuteronomy 5 and read it from the beginning to the end. I'm only going to read for us Deuteronomy 5 verse 9. It says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. So let's just stop here. God is speaking about idolatry. And you know what? Things have changed today. We don't have little statues that we bow down to, but there are still idolatry in our lives today. And God's saying that if you serve something else, if there's idolatry in your life, 
then there will be a curse and the iniquity that's related to that idolatry, the curse that comes because of the iniquity will be visited to the children of the third and the fourth generation. Of those who hate me, those are strong words. You know, I believe that God feels that if we do not keep his commandments and if we worship idols, it's as good as us saying, God, I hate you. It's, it's strong words, but we need to face that. And then in Numbers 14, verse 18 to 19, we see again, well, this is before Deuteronomy, but the Lord says, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until, until now. And that's another thing that I want to challenge you with. A lot of people think that the forgiveness of sin only started in the New Testament. But go and read your Bible. There's a lot of sin forgiveness happening in the Old Testament. So that may also challenge your doctrinal bias because we all have a doctrinal bias. We are biased by what we are taught in the church and by our parents as we grow up, but we never measure that against the truth of the word of God. And the truth is that God has been forgiving sins from the very beginning. And since there was no sacrifice for sin, sin was basically just you had to uh, pray and, and trust the Lord that in his mercy and his grace, he would forgive you. So we see here again, the Lord saying, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. But we also see here that he's gracious and that if we ask for forgiveness, he will forgive us. But it's very important that when we pray for forgiveness, we also deal with this, uh, the curse that came with the sin. Okay. So let's look at practical examples in the Bible. So we see here God saying in Deuteronomy and Levit and Numbers, sorry, that he will visit the iniquity to the third and the fourth generation. So that's our scriptural reference for the fact that there is something like a bloodline and that it gets, because of iniquity, there's a curse that comes on the generations that follow. So before we continue, actually, let me just stop here. What I need to explain to you is that you will not go to hell for the sin that your forefathers have done. Okay, that's not what a bloodline means. Your salvation rests solely on the work that Yeshua did on the cross. When you accept Jesus, you repent for your own sin and he covers it, you are saved. Nothing that a previous generation has done can affect your salvation. So we're not talking about salvation when we speak of bloodline. We're talking about blessing and curse. We're talking about why are certain people that are good believers and live good lives not living lives of blessing. Why do we see curses? And that comes from the bloodline. So I just want to make sure you understand that it's got nothing to do with salvation. It's got everything to do with blessing and curse. Okay, so let's look at a practical example in the Bible of where someone got punished generations later for something that someone else had done. And the first example I want to use is in 2 Samuel 21, verse 1 to 9. I'm not going to read the whole passage. It's, it's included in the notes that I'm going to share on the WhatsApp group. But basically what happened was that there was a famine in the land for three years. This was when David took over the kingdom from Saul. So Saul had died already. David was king. And there's a famine on the land. And then David sought the face of the Lord. And he asked the Lord, why is there a famine in the land? And the famine was related to a drought in the land. And it says in verse 1, and the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So we can see here that not only, you'll see later in the story, were Saul's sons punished for his sin, 
But what happened was that the entire land of Israel bore the guilt, they bore the curse of drought and famine because of one man's sin. So what happened was when they came into the promised land, Joshua made a vow to the Gibeonites that they could stay in the land and that the Israelites would not harm them. And then Saul came and he broke that vow and he killed some of the Gibeonites. So the um, keeping to a vow is one of the commandments that God says we need to keep. We see even Jesus reiterating that in the New Testament where he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So when you make a promise to someone and you break that promise, there is a curse that comes. And this is what happened. Saul broke a vow that previous generations had made with the Gibeonites and he killed some of them. And then the curse that came was later when Saul was dead, not even in his lifetime. The curse came on the land and the curse came on the people. And so David went to the Gibeonites and he asked them, you know what, God showed me that this famine is because we broke the vow, because of what Saul did. What do you want from us so that there can be compensation for what happened? And the Gibeonites said to David, bring us seven of Saul's sons so that we can kill them. So another principle we learn here is that blood requires blood to be silenced. So there was blood calling out. Remember when Cain killed Abel, the Bible says his blood was calling out from the earth. And that's the same thing that happened with the Gibeonites. Their blood was calling out. And so they said to David, give us seven of Saul's sons and then we'll kill them. And then, you know, the, the debt will be settled. So David went and he took one of Saul's concubines' children, seven of her sons, that were innocent. They did not kill the Gibeonites. Their father killed the Gibeonites and they were hung. And after they were killed, we see the famine breaking and it started raining. So we can see that God condoned this and blessed this. The fact that God brought the famine because of the um, breaking of the vow and that because this is what happened, this is what the Gibeonites wanted. God didn't say, no, don't do this because God wrote the rules and he's not going to change the rules. And because Saul broke it, his children paid the price. So this is always such a great example of bloodline. Those children did nothing wrong. They were not guilty of anything, but because of Saul, they had to pay the price. But we see also the curse coming on the land. Natanya, did you want to comment on this story before we continue? Yes, it's just something interesting. You see that David never, uh, he promised to give the retribution before he asked what the retribution will be, what the payback for, for killing or, or breaking the pact that was made earlier by previous generations. And so we see he didn't act in wisdom there. You know, then he might have come to a different arrangement, but this was also where he said, your yes is your yes. So he said he will do whatever they ask. And so he had to do it. And, and that's how we got this um, situation unfolding. And so we must be very careful. I know like our mother raised us to be very careful what we promise God and to make sure that we keep those promises. And if we say yes to something, to keep that yes. Because if you don't, there's going to be repercussions generations down the line that you cannot assist with. Very true. But we also see that, um, you know, nothing happens without God allowing it. So there is a sense of God allowing this to happen to Saul's children because there was no repentance from Saul's Definitely. side. When he did. Yeah. And I think if Saul had realized in his lifetime that what he had done was wrong and he repented, this curse would have never come on the land and on the children. So I think this is a great example for us as well about personal repentance, because whatever you don't repent for now in your lifetime and whatever you don't overcome and deal with when it comes to sin, your children will pay the price. 
So if it's not enough for you alone to stop doing secrets and or, or see, keep on transgressing in the same way and thinking, oh, I'll deal with the Lord when I get there. Maybe it's enough for you to realize your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren will be sitting with this and will paying the price of whatever you're not overcoming. So I think that's a great incentive to deal with whatever it is we need to deal with. In 2 Chronicles 21 verse 7 is one of the many examples. And I encourage you as you read through the Kings and Samuel and Chronicles, there's so many other examples of this. And this is an example of a blessing carrying over on a bloodline. So we see sometimes a curse comes even on a righteous good person. They may sit with a curse because of something that someone in their bloodline has done. But the opposite is true. Some evil people have blessings in their lives because of the things that righteous forefathers have done. And this is an example that I want to use. King David was a righteous man. The word says he was a man after God's own heart. And King David, God made a promise to him that there will always be a man from David's line sitting on the throne of Israel. And we see so many of his descendants being evil and not righteous. And then it always says there, but because of the promise that God made to David, this and this and this happened. So let's look at one of those examples in 2 Chronicles 21 verse 7. Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. And you can read the whole passage. This is in reference to Je Jehoram. I hope I'm saying that correctly, which is the descendant of David. And he was an evil king. He wasn't a righteous king. But God kept him in that place of being the king, even though he killed all his brothers. And he wasn't a righteous man because of the blessing that was on David's descendants. So I want to encourage you, if you just read in, I think it is in Deuteronomy, could be in Deuteronomy or in Numbers, I'm not sure now, but it says, I will visit the iniquity of the forefathers to the third and the fourth generation, but my blessing on those who love me to a thousand generations. So we Exodus see that. 34. Oh, thank you, Natanya. You are such a blessing. So we see here that God says that the actually it's a, a, a reference to us to show that a blessing is always stronger than a curse. So I don't want us to be imbalanced because some people, once they learn about bloodline and curses, it's like that's the only thing they want to focus on. And it is important and we do need to deal with it. But God is also a God of balance. And we, our balance should not be out when it comes to blessing and curses. And we need to understand that, yes, there are curses in your life that you need to deal with. But I'm sure if you go and sit and look at it, there are way more blessings in your life than curses. And the curses always outweigh the uh, the blessings always outweigh the curses the last scriptural example i want to use is from the new testament because a lot of people may say but all of this is coming from the old testament so that's not applicable anymore and we'll do a discussion on that sometime as well because that's also doctrinal bias. But anyway, in John 9, verse 2 to 3, we see that Jesus heals a blind man. And then his disciples come to him and they ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that he, this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So what we can deduce from this is that if Jesus did not believe in bloodlines, he would have rebuked them. If they asked him, Jesus, who sent you? Was it his parents or him? And he didn't believe in bloodlines. He would have said, you idiots, why are you asking this? There's nothing like a bloodline. How could this man be blind because of sin he, his parents did? But Jesus didn't say that to them. He, he didn't rebuke them because he knew it's true that sometimes there are things in your life that you pay the price for that previous people like your parents or grandparents or great grandparents actually did. So this is an example in the New Testament that Jesus also knew about bloodlines and that 
even his disciples knew about bloodlines and believed in bloodlines. Natalia, is there anything you want to comment on about these two examples, David and the blind man? Okay, so do you want to explain to us what about the sacrifice of Jesus? Because a lot of people have this question, but Jesus paid the price. So why are we sitting with these things? Yes, I think we need to understand a few things. First of all, you, um, this is something that Grant Luton said, and it changed my mind completely. He said, you are not saved by your theology. Uh, theology is what you believe to be true from the word, and you follow those rules. And so that's the first thing to understand, and you said it earlier. We are saved only by what Jesus did. You cannot earn the salvation. And you cannot buy the salvation. He has done it for all of us. And so I just want to reiterate again, we're talking here about blessing and curses being passed down from generation to generation. And so, like you also said earlier, if there was sin, or if a, if a covenant was broken, especially if there was blood or murder involved, it required blood to, to equal it out. And so that's the, the first thing I want to say. Yes, our sins are covered. But that does not mean that we don't need to repent from them or resist them or fight them in any sort of way. Now, a lot of us might be the first in, a gen in this generation to realize that, oh goodness, um, there might be people before me that didn't serve God. And so they had never repented. And if they never repented, the blood was never placed over that sin. If you see, for example, with David, the people came and said, you guys broke a covenant with us, and this is why there's no rain. Okay. Logically, that means then, well, now we don't have to do anything about it. I just go on. We now know what the problem is, and I just carry on with my life. No. David had to actively act and repent of that sin. And so that is the difference. Yes, the blood covers it. But if you don't admit the sin as a sin and you don't sincerely repent of that sin, the blood doesn't just come and cover your sins. Okay, so that's very important. So we see our sins and iniquities are carried down to the following generation. Okay, so we receive these iniquities from ancestors that we now struggle with we might have sin in our life and we've been struggling with it our whole lives why is that if jesus then died for us and his blood covers everything why are you struggling with some sin why are you struggling to defeat certain things and so if jesus died for our sins does that then mean that we don't have to repent and that we don't have to turn back from our sin. Of course not. Uh, and the scriptural reference for this is Mark 1 verses 14 and 15. And it says, After John had been arrested, Jesus came into the Galilee proclaiming the good news from God. The time has come. God's kingdom is near. Turn to God from your sin and believe the good news. And so we see we had, and if you read in the New Testament, it often says, repent of your sin, turn back to God. Repent of your sin, turn back to God. And we see, this is the thing that makes the blood of Yeshua, the blood of Jesus, cover our sins in forgiveness. It does not, um, it's not, we're not speaking about your salvation. We're not speaking of being saved. We're speaking of our sins being covered. Because we see even David's sin and God forgave him. And the recipe that David had was he literally went and he fell on his face before God and he repented. And we see multiple people doing that. Moses did the same when the Israelites made the golden calf. He fell on his face and he repented on their behalf and he prayed about uh, their sin and asked God sincerely to forgive them. And this recipe hasn't changed. This is still something that we need to do. And we need to come in humility before God. And we need to make sure that if we do repent of sin, don't just go, I repent of this, I repent of this. Make sure that you mean what you repent of and that your heart is in the right place. Because 
God will see through it. If it's not sincere, if it's not out of a place of knowing this, we have messed up, we have misunderstood, we have done horrible things. Um, you know, God looks at the condition of our hearts in these things, and you might still have a struggle. And often I have a client and we, we sometimes get the same sin over and over again. And I say to them, keep repeating the repentance. Make sure that you humble yourself. Make sure that you repent in sincerity before God. Try and, and place yourself in a situation where the sin was committed against you and realize the pain that it has caused. Realize the harm that it has done, not only to you, but to your entire bloodline. And that's the purpose here, is to realize, um, I think, I don't know who said it, but I once heard someone say, the giants that you don't defeat in your lifetime will become your children and your grandchildren's giants. And so it's such a perfect um, opportunity for us to, to be the generation that says we will repent of everything that comes to mind. And often we have in our family and um, together we have taken the, the commandments and we've repented of them not being, keep or being kept in a, in a row. And that's a way that you can do this, is to get all the commandments and say, Father, we repent of doing this. We repent of not doing this. We repent of maybe doing this. And make sure that you go through all of them because there is just no way that we can know everything that everyone has ever done in these 64 people that are considered our ancestors. And that's the minimum. If I could just explain to you guys that sometimes when we work with clients, we get um, iniquity that went back more than four generations. So there's two things that goes back 10 generations. It's uh, children born out of wedlock, that curse goes back, goes for 10 generations, and witchcraft or sorcery, I think, goes for 10 generations. But then I want to explain something because the enemy, um, he's, he's many things, but he's very clever. Um, and so what he does is he knows that if he can get every generation to fall into the same sin, it resets the clock. So you, let's say someone starts and they fall into sexual iniquity. If their children fall into sexual iniquity, that adds another four generations. If their children falls into sexual iniquity, that adds another four generations. So this is like a snowball effect. Every generation that falls into that same sin adds another four generations. And that's how you can get something that goes back 10, 15, 20 generations, because every person in every generation, instead of standing in the gap and repenting, fell into the same trap and you know what someone needs to take responsibility and change the course of your family line because you can be the one that does that one righteous person can change the course of an entire family line and so i want to encourage you to really take this quite seriously and to stand in the gap and another thing is, I think that we've made the blood of Yeshua and repentance very cheap. If you think of what Natanya said of how in the past David and Moses, the examples that she took, that fell on their faces in repentance. And how quickly we say today, oh Lord, forgive me for this, please. And there's kind of a blasé attitude when it comes to sin. But we forget that that sacrifice that Jesus paid was the ultimate price. And we should not be making his blood cheap by sinning and thinking, I'll just ask the Lord to forgive me later. Okay, so how do you know what is on your bloodline? So one of the ways that you know what to deal with is that you can see something repeat. If you look at a family and you look at your mom, your dad, aunts, uncles, cousins, nephews, nieces, brothers, sisters, you start seeing that in certain people's lives, the same thing repeats. You can uh, see, for example, different addictions, broken relationships, divorce, premature death, um, miscarriages, financial issues, sickness, disease, those kind of things. So sometimes you can see, listen, this is a pattern that's repeating in a lot of people's lives in this bloodline. Let me take one uh, let me just give you a practical example 
I know of someone who uh, had, there were seven or eight children, I, I'm talking under correction now, but five of the children died in car accidents, five of them. And you know what's so scary is that the five of them that died, there was a seven year interval between each of them dying. <laughs> I mean, if you want to talk about patterns and bloodlines, can you see how premature death in a car accident runs in that family? So that's an example of what you'll use. Another thing is you'll see that certain families struggle with divorces, or you'll see that certain families, not, people just don't get married. It's like they can't find a life partner. That's a, that's a generational curse, living, uh, being manifested in that family. Um, and sometimes what you'll find is that in one bloodline, like in, in three siblings, you may find two get married and are happily married, and the third one goes through one divorce after the other after the other. And so there's a curse of divorce on the bloodline, but and it may be dormant on the other two siblings, but on that one, it got activated. But it could skip a generation and be activated on the other two that seem to have happy marriages, their children could struggle with it. So sometimes it skips certain people in a bloodline as well. But that's the one way you'll know that there is something on your bloodline you need to deal with is when you see this pattern repeating. Yes, Nathaniel. So I think something like when you go to the doctor, they tend to take a family history because doctors know that disease run in the family. They'll ask you, did one of your parents have heart disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure? Um, you know, and I know if you, um, I watched a, a, a series the other day and the person was adopted and they got a rare disease and they didn't have any family history for this person. And so they couldn't figure out where this come from Had someone else had this before. And so even the medical field acknowledges that you get things that are in the body that's passed down from one generation to another. And that it's important for you to try and deal with this. Let's say you're father and your father's father and his father, they all had heart disease or high cholesterol or high blood pressure. If a doctor uh, examines you and say, okay, you have cholesterol problems, it does this run in the family? They will tell you, you need to look, you need to work on this because it's just going to get worse. You've seen the pattern, you know? And so it's so interesting for me that we, um, that we sometimes, that the enemy can lie to us where there's such physical proof in our lives that this happens, uh, that we should really just open our eyes and open our ears and find these connections because your spirit lives in your body. And if your body can inherit things, your spirit can inherit things, your soul can inherit things from the previous generation. Thank you. That's a very valid point. And you know, what's interesting is that we, we all accept the fact that there is something like an epigenetic marker but do you know that most epigenetic markers is actually just a bloodline curse that's a mark on your DNA? So I want to encourage you, we'll include it in the notes, but Natanya did an amazing series on epigenetic markers. Go and look at that uh, series because it's going to put it into perspective for you. And, and I also want to encourage you because a lot of people will come and say there isn't something like a bloodline, but we've looked at the Bible now, which is our number one source. Everything we, we measure against, what does the word of God say? But go and look at science as well, because it's like Natanya says, the medical world knows there is something like a bloodline. So um, another way that you'll know that you've got a bloodline that you need to deal with is uh, basically asking yourself, is every area of your life blessed? Because if there's blessing in every, every area of your life, then you've got nothing to worry about. But if there are areas in your life where there is curses, and a curse is anything that's negative, then you know there's bloodline that I need to deal with. And to be honest, guys, I don't think there's a person alive that's human that does not have a bloodline that they need to deal with. In fact, what I often explain to my clients is if you think of someone like Abraham, 
Before Abraham, we don't have that many generations. So we don't have that much inequity. So Abraham probably didn't have a terrible bloodline to deal with or that much to deal with. But if we look how far we are into the timeline of creation, we are in around year 6,000. And if you need to go and calculate how many generations came before us, we are truly a generation that is walking around with a lot of generational baggage. So if there was ever a generation that needed to repent and stand in the gap and clean up, I believe it is our generation. And if we just go and look even at the roots of Christianity and the paganism that's in that. I'm telling you now, we have a lot of things that we do and that we believe that is absolute idol worship. Never mind what our forefathers did. And we need to clean up our lives because we are ending, entering into a time where it's going to be very dangerous when you have those open doors that's going to give the enemy legal right to attack you. Okay, so those are, I'm just saying, everyone's got a bloodline, and whether you like to hear it or not, you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, the next question is, why should I deal with my bloodline? So one of my favorite, favorite things in the Bible to use as an example for our lives today, and you can apply nearly every single situation in life to that story, is the story of the Israelites leaving Egypt and entering the promised land. And that's the same thing for each one of us. Each one of us, God has a promised land. That is what Yeshua was teaching Jesus when he was saying that the kingdom of heaven is near and we can experience that kingdom now on earth already. And that is our promised land. That is where God takes us and he wants us to clean up to get rid of the idols, to get rid of the high places where the idols were worshipped for generations, to clean up that place so it can truly become a place of milk and honey, a place of blessing. And each one of us, we inherit land. You are a landlord. And you inherit land and that land, it works just like inheriting a house or a farm from someone that passes away. You inherit that property, but on that property, we have places of worship where idols were worshipped. We have places where sacrifices were given to idols, just like when the Israelites had to enter the land. And that is where you and I start cleaning up our bloodlines. We need to clean up that promised land, chase out all of those idols, all of the entities, break down the altars, break down the high places, clean it up and rededicate it to the Lord so it can truly be a promised land for you and me today on earth already. And we see in Judges 3 verse 1 to 3, now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had to not known it before. So I don't know who of you were in the webinar that my mother did a few weeks ago on the weapons of God. But basically, we spoke even in, in our previous discussion about warfare, that God is a God of war, and he trains us for warfare. And that's part of our promised land is some of these um, idols and idolatrous kings and entities, God left them from previous generations, because he wants to teach us how to do proper repentance, how to do spiritual warfare. And you'll see also the pattern that we see when the Israelites moved into the promised land. They actually, God says to Joshua, you're not going to conquer the whole land at once. He says, you're going to move through the land and bit by bit, you're going to conquer the land. And that's how a bloodline works as well. You don't do a, one prayer and your bloodline's done. Because it's a process and you start moving through from one point to another to another. And as you move through the land and you start cleaning up, 
there's a process that takes place. I often explain to clients as well, it's layer upon layer upon layer. I truly believe that God reveals certain things as you are emotionally and spiritually mature enough to hear those things, to deal with those things, to repent and stand in the gap for those things. But I think it would be very overwhelming for a person to just deal with everything all at once. And we see that's not the biblical pattern that the Israelites followed either. So I want to encourage you, this is, this is a bit of a process. It's not a once-off thing, but it's a very rewarding process. And every little part of the land that you conquer and that you take back and that you clean, it's going to start going better and better and better with you. So, Natanya, did you want to discuss, uh, comment on any of this? I guess a part of your bloodline, because it's layer upon layer, because it's a process and it's not a once off thing, it also builds spiritual muscle. And this is also how you get trained in, in, and grow in your spiritual ranking. And number one reason why you should do your bloodline is for your children and your children's children, because you want to change the destiny of the generations to come. You don't want them to sit with the same things that everyone's been struggling with through the years. So how do you deal with a bloodline? So the very first thing you do when you deal with a bloodline is you need to identify the sins, the transgressions and the iniquity. And so we need to, to deal with that. So what's interesting is, um, I think it was Rieta McPherson that explained it so beautifully. Sin is something that you do once or twice. It's, it's something that you do and you sin. But when that sin becomes a habit and you do it over and over and over again, it becomes a transgression. And when you die, that transgression gets inherited by the generations after you as iniquity. So that's a great explanation of what is the difference be between sins, transgressions, and iniquities. So the first thing you want to do is you want to get that original sin. You want to find out what is the sin so I can repent for it. And that sometimes we know. You know your grandmother went to uh, someone that read her tarot cards or read her tea leaves or looked into a crystal ball. Or you know that your mother gambled or you know that your grandfather killed someone. So sometimes we know the stories. So from the stories, we know what the sins are and we can pray and we can repent for the sins. Another thing that I, I know Natanya does it as well, that I do is when I read the Bible and I read the Lord says, do not do this, or I punish this and this and this and this, I will stop there and I'll say, okay, Lord, I repent on behalf of myself, my mother, my father, and all of the generations before them, back to Adam and Eve, for all of us that have done this and this and this and this and this. So that's another way to do it. Another thing is we, you can trust the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people get prophetic dreams. They'll dream that their forefathers did certain things. Um, when you're praying, when you're with a deliverance counselor, the Holy Spirit can show visions and then based on that you can repent another thing is the quantum counseling i'm not going to go into detail how that works um you can contact me but there's a lot of podcasts that we've done and there's some courses that i've written but we can test the dna to find the sins transgressions and iniquity and you can repent for that Another way to deal with the bloodline is to identify the oaths, the covenants, the agreements, because those are the legal rights, the agreements that were made, the oaths and the covenants with the entities that are keeping those entities as idols that are living in your promised land. And then a third way to deal with it is prayers of renunciation. I, some people aren't very high on prayers of renunciation. I like it. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Satan is a legalist. And sometimes there's just a little point of technicality that keeps the door open because you don't know to pray about that or how to repent for that. And the people that write the prayers of renunciations go into a lot of research on certain sins and and, you know, especially when you think of stuff like secret organizations and initiation and dedication rituals, there are certain oaths that are made 
that you may not know about and you need to name them and specifically renounce them and that you're going to find in a prayer of renunciation so i quite like prayers of renunciation because like i say satan is a legalist and on one small little technical point he'll keep a door open so prayers of renunciation deal with specific repentance or dedications oaths covenants and other related issues and a lot of times people will ask me do i need to understand what i'm praying and my answer to them this is just my opinion is no because sometimes your forefathers get involved in things that they don't 100 percent understand what they're getting involved in but that counts against them. So I'm pretty sure if you pray from a place of humility and really pray from a place of being sincere, that even if you don't understand everything, you are canceling everything that was put in place. So on the, um, on the notes, I've included some links for reputable places where you can find prayers of renunciations. Now, if you know of other ministries, you are most welcome to use them. Uh, there's a lot of ministries out there that often free, offer free downloads on prayers of renunciations. Uh, Rita McPherson's prayers, there's quite a lot of prayers. I included the free download for you. Go through them, they are amazing. But she wrote six books, it's ebooks. I put the links for each one of them on there, they are quite lengthy. But the information and the prayers in there is unlike anything I've come across. They are really very good. So I want to encourage you, if you want to do deep, deep cleansing of the bloodline and, and even healing of, of wounds in your own life and sins, transgressions in your own life, those books uh, come highly recommended. Uh, Diane Hawkins, I've included her free downloads link, and then G is coaching, they've got a few prayers that's also free downloads, so I've included all of those, and then we've included Natanya's links to the epigenetic uh, podcasts, so I want you to go and listen to that as well. Natanya, before we finish up and we stop the recording, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Okay, guys, I'm going to stop the recording. Please feel free to leave a comment. If you like this video, click the like button. Remember to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to ring the bell.